Hello dear friends, Patrick here, March 5th, 2024. I wanted to start uh, my review of the Canadian Revolution from deference to defiance. Uh, I want to get this down onto video so that I can um, move on to the next chapters. I've gone through chapters 1 to 4 and I'd just like to give a brief review of the uh, first four chapters for you. The Canadian Revolution from Deference to Defiance by Peter C. Newman. He was the editor of Maclean's Magazine and he is uh, just passed away last year. A really great Canadian nonfiction writer. This was published in, uh, where's the publication date here? I'll find it for you. 1996 and it's covering in general, it's covering the time from 1985 to 1995, but he also goes much further than that. He goes into the history of Canada from the time it became a country in 1867 and onward. Um, Peter C. Newman, I read his other book called The Canadian Establishment, which is an excellent book if you're interested in uh, a who's who of uh, Canadian uh significant Canadian wealthy people, you know, the the, uh, the Westons and the uh, Jimmy Pattison and the Reichmans and all these um, wealthy Canadians. Um, but this book is a little different. Uh, chapter one is talking about the differences between Canadians and Americans and just touches on a bit of the history of Canada. Uh, chapter two is... Uh, titled God, The Loss of Faith. So the first, uh, the, uh, chapter two is, is talking about God and religion. Chapter three is talking about the uh, monarchy, the British monarchy and the connections to Canada and the British monarchy and how that faded significantly in the time from 1985 to 1995. And then chapter four, which I just finished, is talking about the Canadian railway system and how that also faded, uh, but over a much longer time frame. But chapter four is talking about uh, derailing the national dream. And that is all about the railway. I mean, this guy was actually on the train that Diefenbaker rode during his campaign um, stops across the country. And so uh, Peter C. Newman, there's nobody that knows Canada better than Peter C. Newman. Uh, the guy really has a amazing talent for writing and also for his knowledge of the history and the pulse, if you want to call it that, of Canada and Canadians uh, for that matter. So what I'd like to do, uh, this is just going to be a quick short video. I want to just share with you a couple of uh points that he talks about and I'm going to share it with you two passages one from page 48 I hate the small font I would have liked to have gotten a big hardcover but this is a paperback that was lent to me um, from page 48 and he's talking about uh, Canada's relation to England to the British monarchy and this is just a paragraph that I wanted to share with you that is an example of the skill that Peter C. Newman had in presenting his ideas and thoughts uh, down on paper, talking about the British monarchy. The monarchy had always been the source of an all-pervasive Anglophile sentiment in Canada. From the very beginning, Canadians, at least those who lived outside Quebec, were raised in the comfort of believing the British monarch would in some way, in some indefinable way, ultimately look after their interests. School kids followed the exploits of Nelson and Drake, not Radisson and Grossier. They read Byron and Dickens, not Leighton and Richler. The two warm weather holidays that counted, Victoria Day and Dominion Day, celebrated the British connection. So did the names of most main streets of most Canadian cities, King, Queen, Dorchester, Nelson, Wellington, Granville. You'll see these street names in almost every Canadian city, especially King Street and Queen Street. Um, the Royal Mail delivered the letters, and the Dominion Bureau of Statistics kept track of trends. 
somehow everything British seemed better, more civilized, more socially elevated. This was held to be true for objects like teapots or tweed jackets. It was also held true for people like the misfits holding Oxford degrees, still smelling of Gestetner fluid who sought economic exile in Canada. Their main qualification was the ability to look down their noses while speaking through them at the same time. Many Canadians were educated by visiting British matron professors who taught badly but applied their makeup with the steady hands of rhinoceros hunters. You can see his style. He, he's um, very talented in, in um, how he shares his insights and feelings about the relationship between the British and Canadians, and this permeates the whole chapter, this kind of style. It can be very filled with dry humor at the same time as being very informative with a lot of uh, interesting facts along the way and little pieces of trivia about Canada and England along the way. And now the second paragraph I want to share with you is just a little snippet from the chapter on God and religion, the loss of faith he's talking about during the period from 85 to 95, again, how... Uh, most mainstream churches lost attendance, uh, perhaps the Pentecostals being the exception that grew in attendance, but uh, Anglican uh, United Church, they all saw their numbers decimated during that decade. And so he talks about his own spirituality uh, near the end of the chapter, and he finishes off the chapter, the second last paragraph on page 40 says, he says here, I am not alone in having discovered that the need for spiritual renewal is essential and that the device of mainstream religion as a means to get there is only one personal option. For many Canadians, the institution of religion has been reduced to a nuisance which gets in the way of their personal relationship with God. I thought that was quite insightful. He's saying that the mainstream churches have become ineffective in helping people have a relationship with God or encounter with God. And uh, it's not really cynical as much as um, insightful. He's, he's, throughout the chapter, he's presenting the reader with actual hard numbers, actual statistics on church attendance and um, how things have changed on the Canadian landscape in different denominations. And at the same time, he puts in his own personal insights. He talks about how his most spiritual experiences have been on the, uh, the west coast of Vancouver. He, he enjoyed sailing and he would sail in the Pacific Ocean and uh, sailing with the orca whales and, and um, leaving the dock and, and coming to shore and all those kind of things. So um, very uh, powerful words and um, very insightful. It's such a pleasure to, to read from somebody who has such a vast knowledge of Canadian history it's almost like sitting down and le letting somebody share, you know, a couple hundred years of knowledge distilled into uh, just um, his own life experiences with, with uh, politicians. He was always connected politically. He was always connected with the wealthy elites of Canada. And so that gave him, uh, he also himself had um, the, I would say the upper class upbringing uh, going to the uh, preparatory schools, you know, Upper Canada College as a child and um, associating with the movers and shakers of Canada, I guess if you want to call them that. And he details their relationship to British royalty and he talks about the British royal family. The chapter on, you know, all the sagas dealing with the history of the royal family, where they got their name and their scandals. And he talks about uh, Prince Charles and uh, Diana and, and uh, Camilla Parker and all these uh, insights that he has. He has a, a vast knowledge of both Canadian and uh, its history in relation to the uh, British monarchy and so on and so forth. So, so anyway, I just wanted to touch briefly on those first four chapters. It's a book of 16 chapters, and so it is quite a, uh, it's quite a slog. Uh, to get through because it's going to be around, what are we looking at here? Uh, we're looking at 470 pages, so, uh, and the font is small, which I don't like, but um, 
hopefully this will help to give me some extra insights on Canadian history that you don't learn in lower class public school, to put it that way. Um, so there you go, the first four chapters, excellent reading, nonfiction by Peter C. Newman called The Canadian Revolution from Deference to Defiance, published in 1996. And um, unfortunately, we lost a great Canadian uh, academic, historian, journalist, and um, just a real national treasure uh, in the, in the uh, man of uh, Peter C. Newman. So I like the quote on the front. It says, a must for every political groupie. <laughs> That's a comment from Richard Gwynn of the Toronto Star. So yeah, if you're interested in Canadian history or Canadian politics, um, you definitely get a kick out of this book. But for a lot of people, I know it doesn't have a broad appeal because people nowadays are more interested in uh, TikTok and uh, video game bullshit and who knows what else. But thank you for watching. God bless you. I hope you're doing well. And we'll get through this book over the next few days, hopefully as uh, we wait the arrival of spring. Thank you again for watching, and uh, we're going to talk to you again real soon, okay? Be good. Spend time with people you love. We'll talk to you later. Take care now. Bye-bye.